Okay, the sermon this morning covers a well it covers quite a, a long passage, right from from verse nine, I think, of, of chapter six through to the end of chapter eight. Uh, so I hope uh, I encourage you to read that in advance because this morning we've just heard uh, chapter seven of of this uh, of this long of this long episode. Now, all of those chapters uh, are they're all about the judgment that God brings about by this flood, or the judgment of the flood, which is our, our title for this morning. And we're going to divide it into three parts. Firstly, there's the, the Lord's command to build this boat, this ark, and that, that would be the means by which he would preserve some uh, from among his creation. Secondly, then, we'll see the, the judgment of the wicked outside the earth by this, outside of the ark by this worldwide flood. And then thirdly, we see the Lord's judgment over, uh, the Lord said, whenever the Lord's judgment had ended, when it was over, we see the the worship of him by those that he had rescued. So please do keep your Bibles open. There's only going to be a few headings on the screen this morning, the verses themselves, the verses I read and so on, uh, the verses I refer to. You're going to have to look at them yourselves in the Bible in front of you. So, so part one then, part one is that God instructs the righteous to prepare to escape the judgment of the wicked. I'll say that again. God instructs the righteous to prepare to, to escape the judgment of the wicked, which is chapter six from verse, uh, verse nine through to the end of that chapter, verse 22. Now I'm borrowing all of the headings this morning from a, from a writer called Alan Ross, and it's his book that I found most helpful when I was preparing for today. Now notice how timeless that heading is, the heading that's up on the, the screen behind me there. Notice uh, how it's still true today, just as it was back then. Now this morning, this morning, each of the three parts of the sermon has two sections. So each, each of the three parts will have a, a section A and a section B. So in part one, we'll be looking at verses 9 to 12 of chapter 6 under the heading, The Righteous Walk with God, But the Wicked cor- Corrupt the Earth, which is chapter 6, verses 9 to 12. So in these verses, Noah is contrasted. Hey, the verses contrast Noah with the corrupt generation who were all around him, this corrupt generation in which he lived. In verse 9, Noah is described as a righteous and a, and a blameless man, someone who, who walked faithfully with his God. Now, walking with God is a phrase that we've looked at before in a previous sermon when we, when we thought about Enoch. And then blameless, well, blameless does not mean that Noah was, was sinless. No, instead it means that he was a man of, of complete integrity. He was a God-honoring man. And that word righteous, well, that describes, describes Noah's relationship with God and his behavior, which results from that relationship. In other words, Noah is a man who belongs to God, belongs to the Lord, and and who lives every aspect of his life in light of that relationship. His is a covenant. We call it a covenant relationship with God, and I'll be saying a little bit more about what that means later on. Now, notice how very different then the, the rest of this generation were compared to Noah. Verse 11, if you have that in front of you, verse 11 describes the corruption and the violence which filled the earth. And then verse 12 tells us how God saw it all. He saw the, the full extent of the, of the willfully corrupted lives of all the earth's people. When you read those verses, it's a, it's a graphic description of humanity at the deepest depths of depravity. Evil filled the earth in those days except for for Noah. And the Lord, we're told, the Lord saw it all. Now, later on, if you've time later this afternoon, perhaps I'd I'd encourage you to take a look at Psalm 14. Make a mental note of that. Psalm 14, because it paints a picture of of a very similar scene. It's just seven verses long. So take a look at, at Psalm 14 later. But here in, here in, uh, in verses 9 through to 12 of, of, of chapter 6 of Genesis, we've seen the, the very stark difference between Noah, this righteous man who, who walked with God, compared to the wicked 
who were all around them, who were all around him and, and who had corrupted the, the earth. Next then in, in verses 13 to 22 of, of chapter 6, we see that God decides to distinguish between the righteous and the wicked. In this second half of, of Genesis 6, we, well, the Lord reveals to, to Noah his plan to put an end to the, all of the wickedness on the earth. And he would do that, he tells Noah, he would do that by destroying all people and the earth with them using this, this terrible flood. And we see that in verse 13 of chapter 6. This is the Lord's perfect justice at work. His perfect justice at work to bring his, his, righteous just, his righteous judgment on all of humanity. They had corrupted themselves and the earth along with them. And so the Lord would destroy them and the world. The destruction he planned to bring was a devastating end to both. All because of humanity's evil. All because of humanity's violence. And the remainder then of the remainder of chapter 6 records all of the instructions that, that the Lord gives Noah for building the ark and for, for bringing on board some of every kind of animal and every kind of bird, plus Noah's own family. Noah, his wife, his three sons and their wives, a total of, of eight persons. And also all of the food that they were going to need as well. And whenever the time would come, we're told, well, when, when that, the time would come, he was to bring on board all these various animals. Notice, though, at the end of verse 20 that Noah and his family, they wouldn't have to go out and, and search for all of those different animals. Now, verse 20 tells us that they would come to Noah. They would come to him to be kept alive. God would see to that. So the, the Lord's hand was, would clearly would clearly, very clearly be on this amazing project, which is essentially, that, essentially what the Lord promises in verse 18. Whenever he declares to Noah, I will establish my covenant with you, and you will enter the ark. You see that in verse 18. Now, this is a, a promise of rescue, a promise of rescue from the destruction that was coming, a rescue which which depended on Noah's relationship with God, a relationship which rested securely on the Lord's covenant, his promises, promises that he had made to Noah. He and his family and the animals who were safe inside the ark, they would survive whilst, whilst every person and every creature outside of the ark, they all would die. That's what verse 17 says. Verse 17 says, I am going to bring floodwaters on the earth to destroy all life under the heavens, every creature that has the breath of life in it. Everything on earth will perish. Now, just in passing, some, some, some would claim that the flood that we read about in Genesis was only, a, was only localized. But verses like this one and, 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 a, and a number of other verses as well, in fact, a, a large number of other verses, would point, I think, very clearly to this flood being a worldwide event. That's just in passing. But anyway, let's get back to our passage for today. Anyway, the Lord told Noah, the, the, told him the ark's dimensions. He told him to build it with, with three floors or three decks. He told him where to put the door and where to put the window and what kind of wood to use and all about coating it with tar to make it, to make it watertight. Everything that Noah needed to know, the Lord told him. And Noah, he obeyed everything the Lord told him. In verse 22, if you have it there in front of you, in verse 22, the Hebrew literally says, Noah did it. He did all the Lord commanded him. He says it twice in the same verse, that, Lord, that Noah obeyed the Lord. You see, that's what it means to walk with God. To live, in a, in a, in a, to live a life in faithful relationship with God. In other words, a life, to live life, a, rich, a righteous life, in humble, in, in humble obedience and in dependence upon the Lord. 
this report of Noah's obedience, even, even though he's living in such a, a wicked and, and such a godless generation, this report of Noah's obedience, this example that we have from Noah, that, should, that, sh- that, that, that would have been a huge encouragement to the, to the Israelite people, an encouragement for them to do the same. And today, as we read these same words, words which are this account which is this account which God gave give to Moses and which we have in our Bibles today, surely we should be encouraged. We should be encouraged to walk faithfully with God in our generation, which is almost as, as godless as in the days of Noah. As we move then into chapter 7 of Genesis, we come to part 2. And our heading here is that the, the Lord destroys the wicked and their world, but saves some through the obedience of one man. Now that's, a, that's a long heading, a very long heading. And that word some, or that phrase some, were saved. Those some are they're often referred to as the remnant now, I mention that now because that's a word that I'm going to be using and I'll mention later on as well. Again, notice the, the timeless truth contained in that heading. You see, for us, for us living today, Jesus is the one man whose obedience is the basis of our salvation. If we're trusting in him, if we're trusting in Jesus, then it's his obedience, his righteousness, which is counted as though it were ours, enabling us to be, to be saved, enabling us to, to be saved from God's judgment. In verses, in verses 1 to 9 of chapter 7, we see how the Lord ensures the escape of the righteous from judgment. And how does that happen? How does that occur? By entering the ark by entering the ark just as the Lord had commanded, and all of that in readiness for the rains which would start in, in seven days' time and which would last for 40 days and 40 nights. Now, just in passing, it seems that this was the very first rain that had ever been experienced on the earth. It's the first time that rain is mentioned in the Bible. Previously, the land was watered from springs and from, from using a mist. We, we read about that in the early chapters of Genesis. In verse 1 of, of chapter 7, again, it's Noah's righteousness which is being stressed. Stressed in comparison, in comparison to the rest of his generation. Again, we're forced to realize just how much Noah stands out from, as a godly man. He stands out because of his godly life compared to those who are around him. And verses 2 and 3 make a distinction between, between clean and unclean animals. One mating pair of every unclean species was taken on board the ark, but seven or possibly seven pairs of every clean species. Now later we're going to find out what all of those extra animals were for. We're not, and we're not told at this stage either which, well, we're not told which animals were clean, which ones were unclean, or why that was the case. But I guess when we realize that Noah didn't, didn't need to, he didn't need to worry about that because the Lord, the Lord would send the animals who needed to be on the ark. We've, we've heard that already a few, verses, a few verses earlier. Now again, again, God's judgment of the wicked is repeated. Look at verse seven, verse, or sorry, chapter seven, verse four. Seven days from now, I will send rain on the earth for 40 days and 40 nights, and I will wipe from the face of the earth. Literally, I will blot out from the face of the earth every living creature I have made. When the flood is over, the wicked will be gone. And Noah's obedience to the Lord's commands, that's repeated a number of times in this little section as well, especially verse nine, well, verse five and verse nine. Then in verses 10 to 24 of chapter seven, we, we read how the Lord's judgment completely destroys the wicked and their world. These verses describe God's, God's catastrophic judgment and how it results in the death 
of all sinful people outside of the ark. Now, if that's not a warning to those who shun God's rescue, then I don't know what is. Surely this whole generation who died in the flood, they serve as a warning, a powerful warning of the judgment that's coming whenever Christ Jesus returns. Meanwhile, for Noah, Noah, him coming safely through God's judgment into this new age after the flood, that's a powerful reminder that even the worst catastrophes cannot stop God's plans to bless this world, this world that he has made. How is that possible? Well, because he's the sovereign Lord and he has control over everything that happens. Everything is under his control. The whole flood account confirms God's power over his creation, just like we saw in, in chapters 1 and 2, where we read how he made it all. This whole account also shows him to be a God who judges sin and who judges sin decisively. And just like we heard last Sunday, we are were, we were reminded again here today that only by God's grace can a person be saved. Only by God's grace can a person escape God's judgment. Grace, like what Noah experienced. You see, Noah wasn't sinless. And so he deserved to perish, to die too. But the Lord graciously spared him, and not just him, but his family too. Now questions, questions about where all of this water came from and where it went to afterwards, questions like those and others, they simply aren't addressed by the, by the Bible. And so we're not going to spend time on them this morning. But if you're interested... If you're interested, do come and talk to me afterwards. That takes us then to, to chapter 8, which is part 3. Part 3 of today's sermon. Here, here the heading, borrowed from Alan Ross like all of the others. Here the heading is the righteous remnant that God saves establish a new humanity on the earth. For the Israelite people receiving this, this account from, from Moses, this chapter, chapter 8, would have been the most encouraging part of this whole flood episode. And it ought to encourage us too. For you and me, this chapter should be hugely encouraging. Noah, this man who had received God's grace, a righteous man who, who walked with God, he survived the judgment of the wicked. He survived the judgment and begins to establish a new humanity on the earth. In verses 1 to 19 of chapter 8, we're told how, how God restores his creation after the judgment is complete. After it's finished, God restores his creation. Here we see many of the events of the creation account being repeated. We have the water receding. We have dry land appearing. We have, we have vegetation growing and mankind again dwelling on the earth. This really was a new beginning. We see a similar pattern repeated throughout the Bible in that, in that after each time of devastating judgment, God would start over with a remnant, a remnant of those who were faithful. Verse 1 of chapter 9, God remembered Noah, Noah we're told. Now that doesn't mean that somehow he had forgotten Noah. No, it means that his actions, God's actions towards Noah were because of an existing commitment that God had made to Noah. In other words, the Lord faithfully kept his promise by intervening to bring this flood to an end. And so God stopped the rain, and he stopped the water flowing up from the underground springs. And after 150 days, as the water level went down, the ark came to rest in the Ararat Mountains which is somewhere in, well, it's in modern-day Turkey, uh, near, the, near, the, near its eastern border. I think near the, near the border with uh, Iran and Armenia, I think. And after a while, other mountaintops started to become visible. 
And in time, Noah sent out some birds, first of all, a raven and then a dove, possibly two doves, I can't remember. Hey, maybe it's one dove sent out twice. But he did so in order to see if the land was, was dry. Until at last the dove didn't come back. That was, the, that was several months after the ark came to rest on the Ararat Mountains, indicating that the land was now sufficiently dry. And in total, that was over a year that Noah and his family and all of these animals had been inside the ark since that rain began. And that's when the Lord commanded Noah that it was time for them all, every one of them, him and his family and all of the animals, to leave the ark and once again to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. That's verses 16 and 17. Which brings us then to the very last, well, the last three verses of chapter 8 and the end of the passage that we're considering this morning. And in these verses, we read how those rescued acknowledge their gratitude to the Lord in worship. It's worth us taking a moment to read those three verses. Verse 20 says, Then Noah built an altar to the Lord, and taking some of all the clean animals and clean birds, he sacrificed burnt offerings on it. So that's why there were more of those clean animals. The Lord smelled the pleasing aroma and said in his heart, Never again will I curse the ground because of humans, even though every inclination of the human heart is evil from childhood. And never again will I destroy all living creatures as I have done. In other words, he would never again use a flood to destroy the whole earth. We, we read in First or Second Peter that when he comes to destroy the world again, it will be in f- using fire. Verse 22 then, it says, As long as the earth endures, seed time and harvest, cold and wheat, summer and winter, day and night, will never cease. What we need to realize in these closing verses is that Noah's sacrifice is hugely significant. As Alan Ross points out, burnt offerings like these represented the worshippers' total surrender and commitment to the Lord. And the description of the Lord smelling it as a sweet aroma indicated the acceptance of the worshiper. Now notice it's, it's not just the acceptance of the, of the offering, but of the worshiper too. And Ross continues, the, the people of God are to be a worshiping people, offering to God the praise of their lips and the best of their possessions. And that remains the case even today. Noah could see that, that having been spared from God's wrath, they have been redeemed and that they were now being, also being restored. And Noah's response, his very natural response, is to worship. His response was gratitude, and that led him to worship God and express that gratitude. And that should be our response too. We have seen today that that God will judge the wicked. He will judge the wicked decisively. And that he does so in order to start afresh with, with the worshiping community of his people. Today we've heard how God did that in the past at the time of Noah. And the New Testament assures us that God will do so again whenever Jesus Christ returns. Our holy God has purged this world of evil. He's done it before. And so he's more than able to do that again. And so we need to be sure that we're ready for when that day occurs. In other words, that we are among God's people as those who live each day for him. Humbly trusting on Christ Jesus. Now, if anyone here today is unsure or uncertain of whether you're ready, I'd be more than, more than happy to talk with you about that. And we need to be people who are telling others, telling others and, and warning them of this judgment which is to come and urging them to, to run to Jesus for forgiveness, to run to Jesus and experience the welcome that he so graciously offers. That's what we need to be doing. And that's a powerful aspect of our message today. And that's where we finish this morning.